23 to 28. Listen to part of a lecture in a history class. I'd like to expand on something I mentioned earlier um, cultural diffusion. Like I said, this is the process by which ideas move from one cultural group to another over long periods of time. This typically occurs as a result of trade or war. For the rest of the class, we are going to discuss a famous example of this the development and spread of the Latin alphabet. Before we get into this, though, I should probably point out that the Latin alphabet is the one we use today. It's a phonetic language, meaning that each of the 26 letters represents a specific sound. Some letters can even represent more than one. For example, the pronunciation of a vowel changes if there is an E at the end of the word, like tap and tape. Of course, these are English words. In, say, French or German, the letters would stand for slightly different sounds, but the basic principle still applies. So, where did this versatile writing system originate? Well, it can be traced back to the Phoenicians, a group of people from the Middle East. They were one of the first to develop a writing system based on symbols for specific sounds. Prior to this, individual symbols were usually used to express entire words or concepts. Anyway, the superiority of the Phoenician system was recognized by the Greeks, who adopted it in the 8th century BC and、uh, modified it to suit their own language. Um, the Greeks modified the Phoenician alphabet. What exactly did they have to change? Well, they changed the shapes of many of the symbols.、Uh, the ancient Greek letters are similar to modern ones, but they also added quite a few new letters. You see, the Phoenician alphabet didn't include special vowel symbols.、Um, some letters were both consonants and vowels. The Greeks created new symbols for each. Now, during this same period, Greek traders were establishing colonies on the Italian peninsula. As a result, variations of the Greek alphabet came to be used by the different groups that inhabited this region. And when the Romans rose to power a few centuries later, they adopted the writing system of one of these earlier civilizations. Of course, the Romans made a few minor changes.、Uh, for example, they added the letter G and eventually Y and Z as well. But their most important contribution was to spread this alphabet as they expanded their empire.、Um, Latin was used for all government records and trade documents, so people in conquered territories tried to learn how to read and write in this language. But、uh, the Roman Empire eventually collapsed, right? Why did this writing system continue to be used? A couple of reasons, actually. First of all, Latin was used by church officials in Europe for centuries.、Um, this allowed them to communicate with each other easily, even if they had different native languages. The other reason is the flexibility of the Latin alphabet. These letters can express almost any sound, so medieval scholars in Europe found it easy to apply this writing system to their own language. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. 23. What is the lecture mainly about? Listen again to a part of the lecture, then answer the question. For example, the pronunciation of a vowel changes if there is an E at the end of the word, like tap and tape. Of course, these are English words. In, say, French or German, the letters would stand for slightly different sounds, but the basic principle still applies. 24. Why does the professor say this? Of course, these are English words. 
25. What was unusual about the symbols of the Phoenician writing system? Twenty six. In the lecture, the professor explains the changes made by the Greeks to the Phoenician alphabet. Indicate whether each of the following is a change. Twenty seven. How did the Greek writing system spread to Italy? Twenty eight. Why was the Latin alphabet still used after the end of the Roman Empire? Twenty nine to thirty four. Listen to part of a lecture from an astronomy course. When you hear the word star, you probably think of something like the sun, a massive ball of gas that produces huge amounts of energy. Well, there are actually many different types of stars. For the rest of the class, I want to focus on brown dwarfs. Um, this type of star is, well, it has some features that may surprise you. First of all, brown dwarfs are only a little larger than Jupiter, which is the largest planet in the solar system. This means that they are much smaller than other types of stars. However, there is a great deal of variation among brown dwarfs in terms of mass, um, the amount of matter they contain. Some are about 13 times the mass of Jupiter, while others are almost 80 times more massive than this planet. So, They are about the same size as a large planet, but they include more matter. This means that brown dwarfs are much denser than planets. Now, does anyone want to guess what else distinguishes brown dwarfs from planets? Well, they're stars, right? So clearly they emit a lot more energy than a planet. You got it. You see, as matter is compressed or made denser, in other words, it becomes hotter. So, brown dwarfs do release some energy out into space, mostly in the form of infrared radiation or heat. It's important to note, though, that the amount of energy a brown dwarf produces is tiny compared to that of regular stars. Most brown dwarfs are about one sixth as hot as the sun, and many are much cooler. In fact, some are only as warm as an oven used to bake bread. Um, I assume this is because a regular star has a greater mass than a brown dwarf? Right. And this is a direct result of the brown dwarf formation process. Um, in fact, the initial stages are the same for all types of stars. An object called a protostar is created when gravity causes dust and gas in space to join together. Over time, the protostar collects more matter, causing its mass to grow. If it becomes massive enough, nuclear fusion will occur. This is the main source of energy in most stars. But in the case of a brown dwarf, matter stops being added before this happens. The protostar never gains enough mass to start a nuclear reaction. So I guess you could say that brown dwarfs are failed stars. They have a mass greater than that of planets, but significantly less than that of other stars. Yes? I was just wondering, how common are brown dwarfs? I mean, 
It sounds like they form under a very specific set of circumstances, so they must be pretty rare. To be honest, no one knows for certain. You need to keep in mind that because they generate such small amounts of energy, they are incredibly difficult to detect with telescopes. It was only in 1988 that the first brown dwarf was spotted, so everyone just assumed that they weren't common. But as technology improves, More and more of these stars are being observed. This has caused some astronomers to reconsider. One recent estimate states that there are over 70 billion brown dwarfs in our galaxy alone. This is just speculation, though. I'm a little skeptical, honestly. I wouldn't take it too seriously at this point, unless further research supports it, of course. Now get ready to answer the questions. You may use your notes to help you answer. 29. What is the lecture mainly about? Thirty. What does the professor say about the size of a brown dwarf? Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. Now, does anyone want to guess what else distinguishes brown dwarfs from planets? Well, they're stars, right? So clearly, they emit a lot more energy than a planet. You got it. You see, as matter is compressed or made denser, in other words, it becomes hotter. Thirty-one. Why does the student say this? Well, they're stars, right? Thirty-two. In the lecture, the professor explains the steps in the formation process of a brown dwarf. Put the steps listed below in the correct order. Thirty-three. According to the professor, why are brown dwarfs difficult to detect with telescopes? Thirty-four. What is the professor's attitude toward the recent estimate about the number of brown dwarfs?